This episode was brought to you by Dashlane. Never forget a password again. The raging debate over the mega popular app Tinder. Online dating disaster. Another horror of online dating. Victims of online dating scams. Busting cheaters on Tinder. Is it me or did it used to be so much easier? I hate online dating because it is the most undignified way to meet anybody. I prefer to meet men the old fashioned way in a bar. You go to a bar or a coffee shop, you ask someone out, next thing you know, you're married. What do you think about Tinder, which is essentially just a hookup site? I'm just terribly sad about it. Edward Snowden oh. is the newest addition on the dating <clears throat> app Tinder. It's really nothing more than an online app, a dating app for gold diggers. But instead of meeting a woman, two men show up. Tinder is a great place to meet someone who's married. Social media is destroying our lives. I'm a Hi, I'm Dylan, and this is Not Exactly Normal. One of the complaints that you may have heard about us lazy, fragile millennials is that we have terrible social skills and we're really bad at dating. Real FaceTime can be a foreign concept for millennials, so etiquette experts are busy helping them polish their manners. Classes are now in high demand. This one at the luxurious Plaza Hotel in New York City sold out within hours. The focus was dating. To avoid embarrassment, experts say hold your cutlery like this. To take a break, place your silverware down in a V on your plate. When we're finished, we just put prongs up in the four o'clock position. Now that you've learned how to eat, I do think that I spend way too much time staring at my phone. Yet the problems that young people face today with dating are nothing new, and people tend to forget about this. All we do is feed the information into the computer up here, and after a few minutes, the lady suitable to you will come out there. That is a clip from the 1970 comedy Carry On Loving. The film's premise is based on the popular trend of computer dating that grew throughout the 1960s. People often forget the problems they faced as young people, and they project their idyllic, romanticized memory of their young adulthood onto the youth of today. Let's plan to get home in time for a sandwich or something next time. Say, that sounds good. I hear people complain all the time that millennials are too gun-shy to ask someone out in person, and so they rely on technology to do it, when really they should do what they did, walk into a bar, ask someone out, and live happily ever after. Is it me, or did it used to be so much easier? You go to a bar or a coffee shop, you ask someone out, next thing you know, you're married. Unsurprisingly, this romanticized ideal of meeting people in bars was never particularly universal, and the youth of the 1960s faced similar dating problems to the youth of today. Hey, Jerry, there's that new girl in our math class. Oh, yes. Her name's Carolyn Ames. She's a swell kid. Why? Well, she always looks nice to start with. Yeah, especially when you compare it with some of the weird characters in this place. Yoo-hoo! Meeting new people is hard. It's annoying and boring to go to mixers. Small talk with strangers sucks. Blind dates are at best awkward and at worst a waste of time and money. And joining a club just to meet someone seems counterintuitive. Say, Kay, next Friday there's going to be a weenie roast. Or there'll be a bowling party if you'd rather do that. Or, or we could go to the band concert. Oh, I'd enjoy going to the weenie roast very much. These are problems faced by every generation, yet the youth of the 1960s were probably the first that were able to take a different approach to it. They introduced technology to dating, and thus computer dating was born. What's that? I call it a marriage development board. It represents the psychological distance between a husband and a wife from the time they are born until they die. Like the myriad of swipeable dating apps today, the youth of the 1960s wanted a system that could do the heavy lifting for them. Boing. They wanted A, a filter, so that you didn't end up on a date with someone that you have nothing in common with, and B, a way to expand your dating pool beyond your friend network. While it wasn't possible at the time to instant message, swipe, or quite crucially see pictures of the other person with the computer, they were able to get pretty far. Most of them worked like this. The computer dating company would send you a questionnaire, which you would fill out and return to be processed by their giant love computers. Oh sure, the Frankie Act 7 looks impressive. Don't touch it! 
but I predict that within 100 years, computers will be twice as powerful, 10,000 times larger, and so expensive that only the five richest kings of Europe will own them. Would it be used for dating? Well, theoretically, yes, but the computer matches would be so perfect as to eliminate the thrill of romantic conquest in a even way. The computer would take into account your interests, hobbies, likes, dislikes, and then weeks later would return a match. The first of these services was started in 1959 by two computer science students from Stanford. They called their company the Family Planning Service, which sounds a lot more like a Planned Parenthood type deal than a who's hot in your area service, but hey, it was the 50s. The two boys used to host mixers. They would invite boys from the engineering program and girls from the nursing program, and then have them introduce themselves to one another, have a quick conversation, and move on to the next person. Being the young, hip entrepreneurs that they were, they thought that they could replicate that experience using computers. To get started, they had access to a real sleek IBM 650. They designed a questionnaire and made a program that compared the boys' answers with the girls, and the program would match the most compatible answers. Those with the highest level of compatibility would be match number one, and they'd be removed from the pool. Match number two would be the second highest, and so on, until you got to the last match. These people had virtually nothing in common, but were matched anyway. Once matched, everyone would meet their matches at a party, and then likely realize that the other had lied on their questionnaire in hopes of meeting a hottie. It's okay, I got rid of him. Oh, that's well, how'd you do it? Oh, it was easy. I just made up a story about having to go somewhere, and he fell for it. Oh, great. Now you and I can go out tomorrow and have some real fun. Sure, come on, let's dance. A story as old as time. As the 1960s rolled around, the computer dating industry would snowball. One of the biggest successes in the field came from an English woman named Joan Ball. In 1961, she left her job working for a marriage bureau, a company that helps you find a spouse, to start her own computerized marriage bureau. Her whole approach was opposite from what everyone else was doing. Instead of asking people what they wanted, she asked them what they didn't want. No fatties, no baldies, no smokers. You get the idea. This strategy was quite successful, and they found particular success by advertising to cool young people who listened to pirate radio. In 1965, she merged with another marriage bureau, and they changed their name to better reflect their computerized business, Compat. By 1970, Compat had the most advanced computer dating program in the world. They could process up to 50,000 questionnaires in a single weekend and give clients a list of four potential matches. How do we know when we've got a sensational product? How do we know how much to produce? How much to spend on advertising? That's where the computer comes in. It may not always tell you what to do, but there are times it's going to tell you what not to do. Why not do it anyway? Though, a year later, it would all come crumbling down. A prolonged post office strike, as well as a change in British newspaper advertising policies, led to a steep decline in business, and in 1974, Balls sold the company to their main rivals, Dateline. Dateline marketed themselves as a way to meet cool people, not spouses. They were the tinder to Compat's OK Cupid. But they had a reputation for being sleazy, as their founder, John Patterson, landed himself in some trouble for using his service to attempt to sell a, quote, list of women who would be your escorts. Despite their reputation, Dateline managed to stay in business deep into the 90s, only closing down after Patterson died. Over in America, the computer dating king of the 1960s was Operation Match. In 1965, three Harvard students, Jeff Tarr, Von Morrill, and Douglas Ginsburg, were sitting around talking about how much they hated blind dates and mixers. The topic of our discussion is the mixer next Friday night at school. You're going, aren't you? I don't know, chick. Uh, I haven't got a date yet. Well, grab yourself a girl and come along. I'd like to, chick. Yeah, I sure would. And they had the, at this point, not terribly original idea of thinking that computers could help you meet compatible people. Hearing about the successes of Compat in England, they founded Compatibility Research Incorporated, and their first enterprise was Operation Match. The goal was to build a computer dating service that was more fun than a marriage bureau, but had better results than a mixer. They paid a friend $100 to write the program, and they rented out a computer for two hours a week to process the questionnaires. 
Their questionnaires were reportedly fun to fill out, and it only cost $3 to submit. They were geared towards college students and featured some rather taboo questions, such as, is extensive sexual activity in preparation for marriage part of growing up? Have there been any marriages resulting from your matchmaking? Oh yes, there have been several. There would have been more, but we're dealing with a young group and we're a dating service, not a mating service. I see. Well, it put me in that place. In their first months of activity, they made over $24,000, about eight times more than it cost to attend Harvard at the time. Soon they spread across the country. If they hooked one student in a dorm room, they would get the whole dorm. By the end of the run, they had processed questionnaires for over a million people and had grossed over 1.8 million in today's dollars. Computer dating in the 1960s wasn't nearly as popular as it is today. It was very expensive, it took a long time to get a match, and you couldn't do it yourself. Yet if you still have any doubts that earlier generations weren't all natural social butterflies and dating masters who didn't need to rely on technology to find a date, look no further than this article from 1971. Operation Match eliminated the hand-wringing, chain-smoking, dry-throated feeling when a boy and a girl meet for the first time. A lot of the news coverage from the 1960s about computer dating reads like it could have been written today about online dating. Arizona Republic, 1970. Computer dating captures the imagination of an ever-growing number of singles, old, young, divorced, widowed, across the United States. The question is whether meeting and dating by computer is better or worse than traditional methods. I was anxious to go out on my first computer arranged date. John was not my type, even though the computer said he was. Never before has a computer invaded the delicate area of romance on such a scale. Called Operation Match and termed by some as the first sex explanatory course. Sound familiar? Ultimately, these computer dating services fell out for a few reasons. Part of it was politics. Backgrounds. How do they affect getting married? Much of this happened during the Cold War, and several companies, including Dateline, got into trouble as they started to bake political affiliations into their questionnaires. Also, being a new thing, the government had interest in oversight. And as society was far less accepting of different sexual orientations and preferences, many services were shut down for being too risque. Never in the history of the world have the merchants of obscenity the teachers of unnatural sex acts had available to them the modern facilities for disseminating this filth. High-speed presses, rapid transportation, mass distribution, all have combined to put the vilest obscenity within reach of every man, woman, and child in the country. A computer dating startup by Peter Smalls was shut down when they began asking their applicants whether or not they were into BDSM. The British courts defended this decision, saying that, quote, young people needed to be guarded against this sort of thing, and that perhaps even more importantly, the business, quote, could break up marriages. A worry that you still hear today. Tinder, all that stuff that the kids are into. And whether we like it or not, all that stuff is getting people into trouble and ruining relationships. ABC's <laughs> Juju Chang no, with an example. Tinder is a great place to meet someone who's married. New research reveals that 30% of all users on the hookup site are already hitched and almost 50% aren't single. Jenny Day is still reeling from the day she says she found out her boyfriend was cheating on her. Another company, called the British Overseas Air Corporation, was shut down because they offered to hook up traveling American men with British women. They were primarily a cruise company, but came up with the idea of offering a dating service at your vacation destination. They tried to defend themselves by saying that they were a transatlantic marriage service, but their marketing was a bit contradictory. They advertised themselves as tours for the footloose and fancy free. Other companies landed in hot water due to their billing practices. Many companies would charge their female clients more if the man proposed. So in order to pad their accounts, they began hiring actors to falsely propose to women. Price was a big complaint about a lot of these services. Many services had different price points for different clients, with older women paying upwards of $800 for a match, compared to $60 for an older man. Though some of these women paid thousands of dollars, with some paying $3,400 over several years. Many of these spin-offs of Operation Madge didn't even use computers, and they operated out of one room, one man, offices that would take to the carnival method of leaving town and changing names when people caught on to them. These complaints culminated in a hearing in New York in 1971. 
dozens of users came forward with complaints ranging from being sent on dates with alcoholics to dates with men shorter than five foot two to never getting matched in the first place despite paying hundreds to thousands of dollars. And finally, like many an internet dating horror story that you might hear today, especially when your girlfriend watches literally every iteration of the Dirty John story, there were a lot of complaints from women about sexual impropriety, and in some cases sexual assault from dirtbag men who used the cloak of anonymity that these services provided to further their twisted dirtbag ways. Ultimately, many of these computer dating services were successful. People met each other, people got together, people were happy. Though how much that had to do with the computers, rather than just the fact that a certain percentage of people who meet each other will hit it off, is unknown. Thankfully, today online dating has gotten a lot easier, as has being online. To simplify and secure your online world and all of your accounts, you should try Dashlane, who sponsored this episode. Dashlane is a digital identity manager that keeps all of your passwords, personal, and banking information safe and secure. Dashlane has a lot to offer, but my favorite service they provide is their password management tool. With it, I can generate complex and impossible to crack passwords that are safely stored and securely encrypted. Dashlane will then autofill my passwords wherever I need them on the internet, seamlessly across all of my devices, including on my phone. Even if you don't use their generator, Dashlane will store all of your old passwords with just the click of a button. Same goes for updating passwords. Enter your new password and with one click, Dashlane will securely store it. With Dashlane, I no longer have to dig through my old notes on my phone or piles of sticky notes on my desk, trying to figure out which of my Fast and Furious related passwords I used for which of my Amazon accounts. Because for some reason, I have two. Dashlane is free and it's really quick and easy to sign up. Just follow the link in the description or go to dashlane.com slash normal. If you'd like to go premium to get unlimited password storage, unlimited syncing between devices, a VPN, secure file storage of up to a gigabyte, and dark web monitoring, you can use the promo code NORMAL to get 10% off. What do you guys want me to talk about next? Please let me know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of Not Exactly Normal as often as I can make Thanks for watching. You young punks go to the movies a couple of times, do a little necking, and you think you're in love. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. All I wanted to do was ask. You don't have to get sore about it, do you? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jack, but, but look at it this way. You just haven't been around enough to know what love really is.